so let's continue with our talk so a little bit of background a hepatocellular carcinoma is the third leading cause of cancer related death worldwide and how it happens there is a multiple repeated episodes of inflammation and fibrosis which leads to a chronic liver damage and formation of hcc as we can see in the image itself that there are multiple causes it can be an alcohol abuse a viral infection most likely from a b or c virus a metabolic syndrome in obese patient uh, uh, which is known as non alcoholic steto hepatitis or nash related cld and it may be drug induced which can be due to aflatoxins or maybe an anti tubercular therapy and there can be multiple other other drugs which can lead to uh, cirrhotic liver so understanding stages of liver damage so as we can see in the diagram how a healthy liver progresses from uh, progresses up to an hcc uh, once there is a repeated damage to the liver there is steto hepatitis or there is fat deposition or inflammation then the next stage come where there is a fibrosis of the liver and as we can see in the fibrotic stage we can see some dark spots in the image so these are basically regenerative nodules we will be talking about them in the next slide from regenerate uh, from fibrosis then the liver progresses into the cirrhotic liver and finally this cirrhotic liver is a uh, you can say uh, a germ bed for hcc formation a cirrhotic liver uh, the own, the lesion if if you see a lesion in the cirrhotic liver most likely it's going to be an hcc all these changes are reversible but as the stage of the disease progresses the reversibility of these stages becomes less and less favorable for us so coming down to the lesions which we were discussing uh, which started from the fibrotic stage we can see that at the fibrotic stage we have regenerative nodules and as there is multiple uh, repeated re injury to the liver these regenerative nodules they basically transform into dysplastic nodules of low grade these low grade dysplastic nodules then transform into high grade and finally they form a small focus of hcc this small focus of hcc then develops later into a small hcc or large hcc uh, the criteria for which is 2 cm why we are wanting to discuss this is because of the vascular nature of the hcc L look at this diagram so as we can see once that there is repeated injury there is release of vasoendothelial growth factors egf hgf and various other factors which lead to angiogenesis uh, within the uh, dysplastic nodule which becomes the focus for scc now what is happening when these new vessels are formed they take the blood supply from the hepatic artery why we are discussing this because as we know that the major supply for the liver is from the portal vein not from the hepatic artery 80% of the blood supply is from the portal vein so when we are saying that the hcc is taking the blood supply from the hepatic artery this forms the basis of our treatment this forms the basis of a, for our diagnosis itself because it we will see the same in the in the next coming slides but we have to remember this that the arterial supply the tumor takes its blood supply from the artery and this has been repeatedly demonstrated in the animal models perform uh, and in the experiments performed on the animal models and they have shown that once the tumor size grows from 3 mm the hcc grows from 3 mm it starts taking uh, the supply from the hepatic artery rather than the portal vein so coming to the uh, like what we will be discussing first we will be discussing how we are going to establish the diagnosis then the patient selection then patient preparation chemotherapy all these uh, till the end point all these things are basically the procedure steps and these and then finally the re response evaluation of the case so coming to the clinical symptoms so patient with liver disease will most commonly complain to you with the digestive problems they will tell you that the they are not able to uh, void uh, properly the, they are not able to defecate properly the poop will be of different color they have a dark colored urine there will be a loss of weight there will be a loss of muscle they will have jaundice some in advanced stages they can have pruritus or they can have a mild impairment in the uh, consciousness which is known as hepatic encephalopathy so coming down to the lab parameters the four main lab parameters which we go and for the assessment of the uh, patient with cirrhotic liver is a cbc lft ptinr and afp levels now cbc will show us anemia and thrombocytopenia in form of reduced hemoglobin levels and platelet counts lfts will show us an increased serum bilirubin and ggt levels and also it will show us a reduced albumin levels 
coming down to PTNR, there will be a deranged coagulation with raised values of PT and INR and the AFP levels will also be increased. However, this is not a sure shot sign. Uh, it, a patient with cirrhotic liver might and, and HCC might and might not have a raised F AFP level. But if the AFP levels are raised more than 400 to 500 nanogram per ml and we can see a lesion in the liver, uh, in a cirrhotic liver, then we can definitely label it as a HCC. Now coming to the imaging studies which are we are going to perform. So uh, in a patient with liver cirrhosis or a patient with chronic hepatitis B infection without cirrhosis, what we, are, what we use nowadays is Lyrets criteria. Rather than labeling the lesion as HCC, we go for Lyrets criteria and we describe the possibility of that lesion being a HCC or having a malignant potential. How we do that is by performing a triple phase CT or an MR which has an arterial phase, a portovenous phase and a venous phase. And what all features are we going to study in, the, in, these, uh, in, in this imaging study? We are going to see for the arterial phase hyper enhancement which should be non-peripheral. We are going to see a non-peripheral washout. We are going to see the capsule. We are going to see the size and we are going to see a threshold growth or an interval growth of the size of the lesion. So a hyper enhancing lesion which is uh, with greater enhancement uh, as compared to the surrounding liver on arterial phase uh, with a portal washout in the portovenous phase is characteristic for an HCC in a cirrhotic liver. A uh, an HCC may or may not have a capsule. If there is a capsule, it should be smooth, uniform boundary and it should be covering almost all of the uh, liver lesion. The bigger the size, the more are the chances of that lesion being an HCC. A smaller sizes lesion can be a regenerative nodule or a dysplastic nodule and we need to follow up the, in these patients and on follow up if we can see that there is an interval increase of size for more than 50 percent in six months we can confidently label that lesion as SCC. So this is how the Lyrets criteria uh, like how we are going to label like li Lyrets 1 and Lyrets 2 are definitely benign or probably def uh, benign lesions. Lyrets 3 is an intermediate malignancy and Lyrets 4 is a probable HCC with Lyrets 5 is definitely an SCC. Lyrets and there are two different categories also Lyrets M which shows a malignancy but that is not specific for SCC and there is a Lyrets TIV that means tumor in vein. So this is how we label these patients. Now I'll show you this example. I am showing you the arterial phase and a portovenous phase uh, in this patient. And here we can see that there is an arterial enhancement and in the portovenous phase we can see a good washout for this patient. Uh, let me pause these videos for uh, you and here we can see the arterial enhancement and here we can see. So again coming down to the basics which we have just recently dis uh, discussed. Now why there is an arterial enhancement? Because the supply for this tumor is by the hepatic artery and why there is an washout? Because uh, the liver is supposed to enhance in the portal venous phase, right? Because the major supply of the liver is from the portal vein as compared to the arterial phase. So now it explains why this appearance of SCC on imaging. Now the role of biopsy. So do we need a biopsy for these patients? So patient in a cirrhotic liver with a cirrhotic liver with a lesion larger than 2 cm and having these characteristic findings on imaging studies with or without a raised AFP level biopsy is not needed and if the patient why th and there is another reason for this because if we take a biopsy there is a risk of tumor seeding which can happen in these patients so in such patients where the diagnosis can be established by a non-invasive method it is preferred and uh, if you will see like 80 to 90 percent of the patients can be labeled confidently as SCC based on all these criteria but does that skip us the role for biopsy so like we don't need to perform biopsy in all the patients it's not so we have to perform biopsy in those patients where there is a doubtful diagnosis where the lesion is less than two centimeter of size the, the lesion is showing growth but not the appropriate dimensions like not a, uh, there's a no increase of more than 50 percent in six months plus the AFP levels are uh, less or there may be a case where the patient is not having a cirrhotic liver again coming to the same imaging diagram the uh, same imaging which we have shown if you will see carefully this patient is not cirrhotic 
but again we were able to establish the diagnosis without performing a biopsy because this patient had a ruptured SCC and you can see the layer of fluid which is surrounding the liver. We got this fluid out, we sent it for cytology and it the uh, diagnosis of SCC was established based on this fluid. So whenever possible we don't want to take a biopsy of SCC because it will lead to tumor seeding. Now coming to the next category which is patient selection. Now patient selection is based on the staging system for SCC. So there are a lot many staging systems which we can, like I have shown you a list of staging system and apart from these there are new staging systems which are generated nowadays based on AI models but the first staging system which was developed by Okuda in 1985 was based upon four criteria, which was ascites, albumin, uh, bilirubin and the size of the tumor and more or less these criteria uh, are the are the ones which revolve in all the other the all the other criteria all the other staging systems if you will see they follow the same same criteria uh, and what are the important features of the staging criteria you can just see at the top we have to understand the liver function reserves we have to see the performance status of the patient AFP level is required in some tumor status in the terms of number size vascular division or metastasis and there can be other features depending from staging system to staging system. So which of the staging system we need to follow? So it's the BCLC system which is most commonly followed nowadays uh, worldwide. Uh, most of the countries are following this system and uh, this system uh, basically it evaluates the patient in terms of liver function on the basis of child puck score. The performance status is evaluated on the ECOG status of the patient and the tumor status is discussed in the terms of number, size, vascular invasion and metastasis. So we will, there was a recent uh, update of VCLC and so now we'll be discussing about the BCLC staging in stepwise manner. So coming to the liver function reserves, we will be discussing now what is child puck score and how we evaluate the patient. So coming to the child turquoise pus curing. It has five parameters, the encephalopathy, ascites, bilirubin, albumin and prothrombin time. The scoring system is from 1 to 3 for each of the parameters depending upon what values we are getting. And finally, we can have a score of min a minimum score of 5 and a maximum score of 15 on the basis of which we can divide the patient into category A, B or C, a class A, B or C why we want to categorize patients into these class because we want to understand the patient if it is a well compensated patient it has a significant functional compromise or it's a decompensated patient how it's going to affect us it's going to affect the overall survival of the patient at one years and two years as we can see here and also it helps us to identify the patients in which we can perform any sort of intervention in terms of a surgical intervention or an image guided intervention so as simple as that a patient with a class a will have a very good response to intervention a class b we have to select which patients we can perform an intervention or not and a class c should not be taken for intervention these patients will have a very poor response mm -hmm. now coming to each and every uh, component of the uh, child puck score. So first coming to the encephalopathy, as we can see uh, it's graded as none, mild to moderate or grade 1 or 2 and severe grade 3 and 4. This uh, this grading is based on this heaven grading. So what is hepatic encephalopathy as such? So it is a, the piece, basically what happens the patient with, uh, with cirrhosis, they are not able to get their uh, 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 like uh, you, you can say the byproducts of digestion like ammonia and everything they are not basically filtered so these basically pass on to the circulation they go into th they pass the blood brain barrier and they create an encephalopathy state for the patient the patient may show mood swings and personality swings the patient may have a behavior or impulsive control uh, they may lose it they may use abusive word abusive language they may have a problem with the memory concentration thinking they may have motor function problems they like a lot of problems can happen and this is how we grade it so as we have seen grade 1 and 2 they are basically labeled as uh, a, a score of 2 and the patients with grade 3 and 4 are given a score of 3 and we can see the patients with grade 3 and 4 are 
with high levels of aggression and coma whereas the patients with 1 and 2 score are having slight personality disorders or maybe at times just slight motor skills which are being affected with these patients now coming to ascites Asci again we have none mild to moderate or severe so you can also see that the mild to moderate are diuretic responses uh, responsive ascites that means once you give the diuretics these patients respond well and then there is severe which is diuretic refractory so how we label the patients as a diuretic refractory on the basis of these six criteria a lack of response to the maximal dose of diuretic for at least one week a diuretic induced complication in absence of other participating factors and early recurrence of ascites within four weeks of fluid immobilization a persistent ascites despite sodium retention mean weight loss of less than 0.8 kgs over four days a urinary sodium excretion less than the sodium intake so the if if you are facing all these things then you can label the patient as a refractive ascites now coming to bilirubin and albumin and we can see a, a, a bilirubin level of less than 2 mg per dl uh, is 1 from 2 to 3 is 2 and more than 2 uh, more than 3 is 3 uh, bo both albumin and bilirubin can be seen in the LFTs and finally coming to the prothrombin level these are also like we have to go for a PTI and a test and if uh, in that we can see uh, if there is a prolonged PT or if the INR ratio is normal and based on these values we can again label the patient as uh, we can uh, score it as 1, 2, 3 and combining all these scores we can finally label the class of the patient as A, B or C then coming to the ECOG status of the patient. So this uh, this was developed by the Eastern Clinical Oncology Group and we can see a grade of 0 to 5 where 0 is fully aftic patient. Uh, a score of 1, the patient is doing uh, sedentary life but it basically is able to perform his, his, or, his, uh, his, his or her work in a very uh, restricted manner. Well, uh, they, uh, the, the idea is that they can take care of themselves, they can take bath, they don't need any assistance they, and in, in fact they can do some outside work as well. They can do off office work as well. Whereas a grade 2, the patient is now capable of taking self care but the patient is ambulatory at the same time. And when the patient is waking, for more than 50% of the waking hours, the patient is carrying out his or her activities. Whereas in a grade 3, the patient can only take care of himself in a very limited value. It's combined, confined to bed or chair for more than 50% of the uh, waking hours. So you can see at this level, the patient is not able to take care of them themselves. Uh, they, need, they start needing some assistance for themselves. And finally, the patient is completely disabled. And in 5, the patient is dead. Now coming to the tumor number size vascular invasion and metastasis which contributes to the tumor status so uh, discussing same about the bclc now uh, this is a very rudimentary or i would say a basic understanding of the bclc staging system so BC, uh, the hcc and bclc staging system is divided into stage zero which is a very early stage a stage a to c early stage intermediate state and advanced state and finally a terminal stage which is stage d so as discussed, we, we understand now that uh, we have CTP score, we know the ECOG status and we can see in very early and early stages, we are only going to consider the patients which have child A. And as soon as we have a child B, we are going to put these patients in, into the category of intermediate or advanced stage and the terminal stage is a child C status. So now coming back to the child status, you can see that the as the score pours, they start getting poor the terminal stage is there and the, we don't want to treat such patient rather we want to provide best supportive care for these patients because any kind of intervention for these patients will pro will will not provide any benefit rather it will harm the patient and same goes for the ecog status we, you can see that uh, till the intermediate stage we want the patient's ecog status to be zero and in advanced stage and terminal stage the ecog status of one or two is there now coming down to the number, size, macrovascular invasions and the extra hepatic spread. So the patients whom we are treating, these are the very early stage patients, the early stage patients and the intermediate stage patients. So we can see in the early stage there is a single nodule less than 2 centimeter of size, a carcinoma in situ, 
in early stage there is one to three nodules with each nodule less than three centimeter of maximal diameter and in intermediate stage there can be more than three nodules of any size two to three nodules with any nodule larger than three centimeter of maximum diameter and one nodule unresectable with larger than five centimeter of maximum diameter there is no macrovascular invasion there is no extra hepatic spread so the idea is that the disease is still contained within the liver the it has not left the liver it has not infected the peripotal lymph nodes it has not involved any other portion of the body and these patients can be provided good treatment and as the stage advances or the patient goes to the terminal stage we will find that there is a macrovascular invasion or there is an extra hepatic spread so now the intermediate category this is the category which is provided a uh, which is provided taste as solution for the scc so like briefing the same liver function test these are assessed by the ctp score ecox status it is suggested by the cancer related symptoms tumor burden it is discussed in terms of the size number of lesion ex vascular invasion and the extra hepatic spread and finally the treatment alloc allocation of the patient in terms of resection transplantation microwave ablation or rfa taste systemic therapy or best supportive care so now this is the main bclc staging uh, like what they have shown I, I have just shown you the rudimentary one now this is the actual BCLC staging and this is the treatment offered to the intermediate stage patients and we can see that the expected survival is more than 2.5 years if the taste is provided to such patients and on the left side of the screen you can see that the major uh, treatment options provided to the patients are ablation or resection or transplant Previously, resection was taken as the first option, but now, as uh, as you can understand, a cirrhotic liver, the liver is already damaged, and we want to preserve as much parenchyma as possible. So the ablation has taken superior, not exactly superiority, but as a first line of treatment in comparison to resection for these patients. And uh, the patients who can't be treated by taste are now treated by the systemic therapy in terms of. Uh, sorafenib and lenvatinib therapy and uh, the patients who are in a terminal stage are provided best supportive care rather than providing any sort of management because the overall expected survival is not more than three months for such patients so now we will be discussing about taste itself so what is taste so uh, like uh, again trans arterial chemoembolization there are two types of taste uh, or rather three uh, one is C taste, which is conventional taste. Next is uh, DEP taste, which is done by DC beads. And now a new modality is used, which is balloon taste, where we inflate a balloon before deploying the drugs. So in C taste, it involves a super selective intra arterial injection of cytotoxic drugs such as doxorubicin, apirubicin, idarubicin, or cisplatin, which is emulsified uh, in a radio opaque agent, a oil based radio opaque agent like lipidol. And how this emulsion is made, it is formed in a water in oil kind of emulsion. Okay. Now this is followed by an intra-arterial injection of the embolic agent such as gelatin sponge, polyvinyl alcohol particles and microspheres. During C taste, lipidol carries and delivers the chemotherapy agent to the tumor and causes the embolization of the microcirculation. Based on the data from the meta-analysis and the various other studies, C taste was recognized as a gold standard treatment for intermediate stage of SCC with highest grade of recommendation that is 1A in 2012. And here we can see an image of a lipidol vial which is used as a uh, basically carrier for the cytotoxic agent uh, for delivering the uh, into why, why we are using this uh, oil based agent because they have an affinity for the cancer. I will show you in, the, in further slides. They have an affinity for the cancer. So now coming to Deptase. Now in Deptis, what we are using is a DC beads. These are non-resorbable embolic microspheres that can be loaded with the cytotoxic agents and they are developed for providing a more sustained release with, com uh, uh, with concomitant embolization. Deptase is composed of various hydrophilic 
ionic uh, sorry dep particles are basically composed of various hydrophilic ionic polymers that can bind to these cytotoxic drugs by an, an ion exchange mechanism so each ml of microspheres can load around 37.5 milligrams of uh, doxorubicin in 30 minutes to 2 hours so what we do is basically we put uh, the uh, we to put that cytotoxic after removing the supernatant from these dc beads we put the cytotoxic drug we keep it there for at least one hour so that it is uh, like there is sufficient time uh, where these drugs can bind to the uh, microspheres and then this uh, my these microspheres are taken out and uh, they are injected into the patient uh, so now we'll see a case of deptase oh sorry conventional taste so as you can see there was a large tumor 8 centimeter size in segment 7 of the liver and this was supplied by the SMA and uh, so SMA was cannulated and uh, a contrast run was seen where we can see the tumor blush here you can see that uh, selective cannulation of the feeder vessel was done and I can you can see me extending the uh, my, my guide wire there and up on the guide wire we are extending our um, catheter micro catheter and you can see there is a tight loop and there is a little bit of difficulty in progressing this uh, micro catheter and once this micro catheter is extended beyond this loop you can see the tension which is creating on the on the main catheter while proper. so after reaching the base of the feeder vessel you can see me deploying lipidol and injecting lipidol into the patient and after lipidol on uh, in in the side you can see there is a beautiful lipidol deposition which you can see in the ultrasound and uh, these basically the whole of the tumor that goes hyperechoic on ultrasound as soon as the lip uh, the drug with the chemotactic uh, chemotoxic agent is deployed in these patients so this is another example this is the same patient uh, i have shown you the imaging before the patient with the ruptured scc you can see the tumor blush and you can see that i have super selected the feeder vessel and after that uh, we have injected the lipidol agent and at the end of the procedure there is no tumor blush so here you can see that the tum i am injecting the drug into the tumor and finally in the final run we can see that the tumor blush is absent now this was a third case the patient with situs inversus and here you can see that the lipidol is selectively going into the tumor and it is selectively attaching into the tumor and on the right side you can see a post uh, taste uh, you can see a CT scan where you can see a nice deposition deposition of the uh, lipidol and you can see that the whole of the tumor is basically now embolized so now comparing taste to a best supportive care should we leave the patient uh, like for the best supportive care or should we perform a taste so multiple studies were performed and as i told you before also a patient uh, who has like who undergoes a taste uh, has a uh, like sorry the taste is now considered as a gold standard based on multiple studies and meta-analysis taste is con considered as a gold standard procedure for the patients and these were the studies which were able to establish and we can see a patient who was provided taste had a good survival as compared to the best supportive care uh, they had a significantly much more uh, survive overall survival in terms as you can see in the second section of uh, 57 percent as compared to 32 percent and just in the second year it's 31 percent as compared to 11 years uh, 11 percent and in the third year you can see 26 percent of the patient survived as compared to just three percent giving it a p-value of 0 0.002 which is highly significant comparing depth test to ct now now depth test is a more standardized way of embolization it provides a less plasma concentration of doxorubicin so and at the same time it provides a sustained release of doxorubicin over time uh, once the dc beads have been deployed so it has become a treatment of choice in nowadays for all these uh, 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 for all the taste procedures and that is uh, so uh, on basis of studies it has also been found that the tissue concentration of doxorubicin is available up to a month which is not the case with CTs but uh, on on basis of various 
precision tri trials and studies we were not able to find any superiority of CTs over deputies like precision trial there was a precision Italia group trial and there is a meta analysis trial uh, meta analysis by Ficratio in 2016 and all of the all of the studies were not able to establish a superiority of deputies over CTs rather uh, some ja uh, Japanese studies have preferred CTs over deputies because they have considered uh, uh, lipidol as a liquid embolic and they suggest that these liquid embolics they cross the, they cross the AV uh, uh, communications uh, at the uh, capillary level and they go into the venous site and they perform a much better embolization as compared to deputies but again as we can see on the basis of results there is no benefit in overall survival in such patients in terms of safety uh, post embolization syndrome uh, the, the patient can have a post embolization syndrome which is basically a pain fever nausea or vomiting and these can be uh, very easily submitted by providing a profalgan injection or uh, providing a tramadol injection there can be a liver related or biliary injuries which can lead to formation of biliomas uh, or cholangeal, cholangeal abscesses and there can be also hepatic arterial damage while performing like dissection of the artery while performing such proce procedures. Now coming to the contraindications of the TACE. So there are cirrhosis related contraindications, there is SCC related and there are other contraindications. So the absolute contraindication is decompensated cirrhosis. So now coming back to what we have learned. So uh, the patient with a higher child book score a patient with a higher bilirubin level, a patient with a lower albumin level, uncorrected coagulopathies, poor ECOG status, all these parameters while we were selecting the patient. So the patient selection is more important than performing the procedure as we can understand. Patient with hepatic encephalopathy, refractive attack. So all these, uh, these features which we are discussing here, if you see all these features basically go to the uh, will, mil, will make the child book score more and the patient will fall into the category of child C. Then care, there can be in, impaired portal blood flow in form of portal vein thrombosis and hepatofugal blood flow. So uh, these patients what is going to happen if uh, now these patients where there is a portal vein thrombosis these patients are basically taking their primary blood supply from the hepatic artery as the liver has dual blood supply. So what is happening the portal vein uh, the function of the portal vein is now being supplemented by the hepatic artery and we if we embolize the hepatic artery as well that part of the liver is going to die and we can see abscess formation or uh, a further deterioration of the liver function might be possible uh, the patient with the uh, in such patient if the, if the tumor is large the patient might land up into an acute liver failure as well now hcc related features the patient with the high and uh, extensive tumor which is involving both of the lobes or if there is a malignant portal vein thrombosis in cases of uh, malignant portal vein thrombosis now it is seen like uh, at what level uh, the thrombosis is there if uh, the thrombus is at a, a segmental level at, uh, it is considered as a quasi c category and these patients can further pro uh, can be provided with the uh, uh, taste but a patient who has a uh, uh, like a thrombus in the main portal vein or a branch of the portal vein with like the right portal vein or the left portal vein these patients are generally avoided for taste and rather a tear can be provided which is much better tolerated in these patients other options can be an untreatable av fistula and acute infections uh, which can lead into serious complications for such patients so some relative contraindications for again based on the same categories uh, patient who has an untreatable esophageal varices with a high risk of bleeding, a large tumor more than 10 centimeter, a malignant portal vein thrombosis as I said before like uh, if there is a segmental a cos C uh, category these patients can be tra treated so it's a re re relative contraindication and other things like the patient is having a severe comorbidities, a low ejection, highly low ejection fraction uh, with other comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, uh, or uh, there is an incompetent papilla uh, of uh, 
uh, with uh, a new mobilia uh, due to prior biliary stunting or surgery this can lead to the formation of biliary abscesses later on or if there is a biliary dilatation now taste can also be performed outside the intermediate category this can be performed in very early disease as a bridging therapy for liver transplant it can be used in a resectable single lesion up to 7 7 cm or three lesions up to 3 cm in diameter it can be used in combination with local ablative therapies for providing a much better response in patients with recurrent intrahepatic lesions up to 3 cm in diameter it can be uh, treated with CTAs or DEPTAs in combination with RFA or microwave and again as I discussed before in advanced stage with a quasi C patient with a good performance status with a CTP score of A a segmental portal vein tumoral thrombosis a CTAs can be provided uh, as a treatment option and the tolerance level is good with these patients and uh, it also avoids the patient to uh, like uh, a sorafenib therapy can be avoided in these patients if possible now basically summing down all the things which you have read uh, discussed till now so patient selection it depends upon the liver disease and it depends upon uh, sorry uh, the underlying liver disease the liver function reserves and understanding the performance status of the patient which is the child puck score and the ecox status then we want to understand the imaging of the patient we want to see a triple phase ct or mr we can so that we can establish the number of lesions we can see the size we can see if there is an extra hepatic spread or there is a vascular spread a patient preparation can be done prior to the procedure patient has to kept around four to six hours npo with the antiemetic treatment a good hydration and uh, antibiotic prophylaxis can be given so that these patients after uh, the procedure they don't uh, undergo all these complications for chemotherapy we use nowadays generally doxorubicin is used and the dose is 50 to 75 milligrams per meter square of the body surface area or cisplatin at the dose of 50 to 100 milligrams per meter square area a lipidol emulsion is formed in form of a water to oil emul water in oil emulsion where the chemotherapy agent is injected into the lipidol via three way rather the other way around so why we want to do this so that the water so uh, why we want to do this so that the lipidol is surrounding all the water globules the water is not going to mix with the lipidol they these small globules so the lipid will uh, like form a covering over all these globules and this way the lipidol will be able to carry this drug and it will be able to uh, attached to the uh, HCC and provide the drug delivery to the specific site and uh, after this we uh, again if we are not using lipidol we can go for uh, uh, DCB embolization but when we are using lipidol we need to provide another embolization agent which can be a gelatin sponge or a PVA particle generally 100 to 300 micrometer of size is used selectability as you have seen in the multiple examples we have discussed a super selective taste is nowadays the uh, recommendation where we go to the tumor base like we go to the base of the feeder vessel um, and we provide the drug from there and then itself rather than providing the drug from the main uh, from the, like from the right hepatic artery or from the left hepatic artery no we don't do that we go to the base of the feeder vessel and from there we provide the drug and the end point is where there is a lipidol opacification of the small uh, AP shunts and this can also be used as a factor for tumor response tumor necrosis and local reoccurrence and in the response we can uh, that can be evaluated on the basis of M racist criteria thank you so much Switching back to you, Shweta. Shweta. I think uh, she's not there. Uh, 
Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for the comprehensive talk. It was really very really informative. And sir, uh, uh, we have received a few questions from the participating doctors. So, uh, with all your permission, can I give them a quick? Sure. We can go one by one. Yes. Yes, sure. I'm sharing my screen. Okay. I have given the uh, link on the uh, chat box. Kindly register your name and proper email ID. The screen is visible to you, sir? Yes, I am able to see. Okay, this is a nice question. What are the considerations for repeat days in patients with recurrent and residual HCC following initial treatment and how does the timing and frequency of repeat days uh, influence the efficacy and the safety so for this we uh, have certain scoring systems we have an art score we have a son uh, son car score so based on these scoring systems we can basically decide when and uh, how to select the patients uh, for a retest uh, uh, just a second uh, yeah you are asking for a recurrent on residual uh, i'll brief you once again so see if you are confused about taking uh, the patient for an initial treatment, you can go for a state score. A state score uh, uh, is a score which helps you uh, to de define if the patient should be taken for uh, taste therapy or not. Uh, this is apart from the BCLC staging and uh, if, uh, you just have to go around and search and I'll just brief you. So how we have two parameters here, we have a CRP score and the, if the CRP is less than 1, we give the score of 18, uh, sorry, minus 12. And uh, if the CRP is more than 18, uh, sorry, more than 1, then we have give a score of, uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, so how we calculate a state score is, uh, we have a, a base score of 36. And out of that, we need to minus uh, uh, 12 for each of the following parameters. So the two parameters are CRP. If the CRP level is more than 12, uh, sorry more than one and the second thing is the albumin score so based on these things we can calculate a state score and if it is more than 18 the patient is a good candidate for uh, taste and if it is less than 18 then the patient is a poor candidate for taste this is done for choosing first taste now if we go for recurrent taste for a residual scc then we can go for an art score or sonkar score these scores help us to decide if the patient should be taken for repeat therapy or not and this will also and uh, depending on time and frequency or uh, a gap of two weeks is generally given uh, between taste one and taste two and if even after taste two we are not able to see any improvement in the patient then these patients are not going to show an improvement we can go for a third taste but these patients are hardly going to show any improvement they are basically resistant to the chemotherapy agent uh, we can go to the next question then. How does the combination of taste with other treatment modalities like uh, RFA, systemic chemotherapy, immunotherapy impact the treatment? That's a wonderful question once again. So the patients uh, like taste uh, combining with RFA and microwave. Uh, this is the most uh, st uh, like most uh, studied uh, uh, combination which has been going around the and again there are school, two school of thoughts here a uh, patient can be provided rfa and then the patient can go for taste and there is another school of thought also that the first taste should be performed because the vasculature is still in fact intact and then rfa should be performed after two weeks so both kind of uh, philosophies are there so uh, this is the most studied one. Now the coming to the systemic chemotherapy and immunotherapy. Yes, there are recent uh, studies where uh, uh, th there are been uh, there are uh, patients which are given uh, lenvatinib or sorafenib and afterwards after two weeks tests are being done. So uh, definitely uh, now uh, like if we divide this question into two parts the one taste with rfa and microwave and second taste with chemotherapy and immunotherapy so taste with rfa and microwave it's uh, like it has wonderful results wonderful the results are nearly 100 percent they compete with the hepatic resection uh, results and most of the people uh, uh, if 
costing uh, like is not the factor for these patients we want to perform this thing the results are excellent for the patients and but again these are generally limited up to the uh, tumors with size of 5 cm or 6 cm something like that the patients with the who have been pro, uh, like provided chemotherapy or immunotherapy these are v like much larger tumors uh, going up to 7 cm 8 cm uh, in the literature which we have but the literature is still very less and as you re if you can remember from our slide uh, the first uh, case the conventional taste one that was also a lanvert a, a taste which was performed post lanvertinib uh, so lanvertinib uh, therapy was provided for 2 weeks in that patient and after that taste was performed so coming down to result of that patient so uh, the result was good the patient had uh, like that uh, there was no enhancement in the uh, uh, like the uh, uh, repeated imaging after one month and one and a half month but uh, like again with these large sizes of the tumor the sometimes the result is not overall good with these patient and again these uh, chemotherapy and immunotherapy patients are not very well studied and i don't think a lot of literature is there with this particular mode of therapy where sorafenib or when lenvatinib uh, is provided and then after two weeks a taste is performed and again if we, uh, the question itself states so again if you remember the bclc staging uh, we go for these kinds of therapy if we have already crossed the intermediate stage we are already in the advanced stage of so at times it's not going to provide good results to the patients as of the literature available right now but might be possible that things change what we have once we have meta-analysis and more studies with us uh, next question what are the expected outcomes and response rates following taste in terms of tumor size reduction local tumor control and uh, survival benefits for the patient with hepatocellular carcinoma so i think uh, uh, we have discussed this uh, the survival benefit so uh, in terms of survival benefit uh, and with comparing with the best supportive care we have a good result uh, uh, like taste is far superior to best supportive care now coming to the tumor side reduction so how we categorize it uh, like we have three response uh, this is more with the uh, response criteria of the which uh, I have discussed in the last the M racist criteria so we have three kinds of response the one there is a complete response then there is a stable disease and then there is a progressive disease so the complete response is we can see uh, there is a reduction in the size and there is no enhancement of the tumor uh, so that can be seen up to 50 to 60 percent of the patients stable disease which stands for local tumor control can be seen in around 20 to 30 percent of the patients and uh, progressive disease is seen in 10 to 20 percent of the patients uh, 